the argument that films are a social narrative about something other than what they are explicitly showing, or a fable with some kind of deep meaning, is often argued as being identified as intertextuality by some film theorists. Intertextuality, in reference to film theory, is the notion that every text is related to other texts, and thus an intertext. Basically, Robert Stam suggests that works of art are influenced by the world we live in. Intertextuality, the elements or conventions and or plots in the text that influence that text in question, is heavily at play when it comes to self-reflexive horror disaster films like Cabin in the Woods. Films such as Scream have sparked an interest in self-reflexive horror and disaster films which led to self-reflexive parody in Scary Movie and eventually leading up to Cabin in the Woods by the year 2012. First off, what is a text? A text within the context of film theory is defined as the internal structure and organization of any one film, or simply a film wherever it is conceptualized as a system. So, if we take into consideration Wes Craven's 1996 horror thriller film Scream, one can argue that the film is constructed by intertextuality. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, Halloween. You know, the one with the guy in the white mask who walks around and stalks babysitters? The film is a self-reflexive construct, or text, based on previous films of the same genre. First off, take a look at the following scene. We are introduced to a dialogue between characters, analyzing the murders going on within their community as if they were analyzing a horror movie. Oh, now that's in poor taste. What? If you were the only suspect in a senseless bloodbath, would you be standing in the horror section? Well, it was just a misunderstanding. He didn't do anything. You're such a little lap dog. He's got killer printed all over his forehead. Okay. Really? Why the cops let him go, smart guy? Because obviously they don't watch enough movies. This is standard horror movie stuff. Prom night revisited, man. Yeah? Why would he want to kill his own girlfriend? There's always some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. That's the beauty of it all. Simplicity. Besides, if it gets too complicated, you lose your target audience. Well, what's his reason? Maybe Sydney wouldn't have sex with him. <laughs> I think it is. You know, I think it's her father. You know, why can't they find her pops, man? Because he's probably dead. His body will come popping up in the last reel somewhere. Eyes gouged out, fingers cut off, teeth knocked out. See, the police are always off track with this shit. If they'd watch prom night, they'd save time. There's a formula to it. A very simple formula. Everybody's a suspect. I'm telling you, the dad's a red herring. It's Billy. How do we know you're not the killer? Huh? Huh? Hi, Billy. Maybe your movie freaked mind lost its reality button. You ever think of that? You're absolutely right. I'm the first to admit it. If this were a scary movie, I'd be the prime suspect. That's right. And what would be your motive? It's the millennium. Motives are incidental. Millennium? Hmm. Millennium, I like that. That's good. It's the millennium. Good kid. Millennium. Good word, my man. Are you telling me that's not a killer? Eventually, the murderers reveal themselves. We hear this. Hmm. Corn syrup. Same stuff they use for pig's blood and carry. This? You hear that, Stu? I think she wants a motive. <laughs> hmm. I don't really believe in motive, Sid. I mean, did Norman Bates have a motive? No. Did they ever really decide why Hannibal Lecter liked to eat people? Don't think so. You see, it's a lot scarier when there's no motive, Sid. We did your mom a favor, Sid. That woman was a slut bag whore who flashed her shit all over town like she was Sharon Stone or something. Yeah, we put her out of her misery. Because let's face it, Sidney, your mother was no Sharon Stone. Hmm? That motive enough for you? This? Guess we won't be needing this anymore. Uh-huh. Yeah, oh, look at this. Ring, ring. Oh, 
need this. Got the ending figured out yet, Sid? Come on, Sidney. You think about it now, huh? Your daddy's the chief suspect. We cloned his cellular. Evidence is all right there, baby. What if your father snapped? Your mother's anniversary set him off and he went on a murder spree killing everyone. Except for Billy and me. We were left for dead. Then he kills you and shoots himself in the head. Perfect ending. I thought of that. <laughs> Watch this. And this. You see, Sid, everybody dies but us. Everybody dies but us. We're going to carry on and plan the sequel. Because let's face it, baby, these days, you got to have a sequel. No! No! He's sick for fuck's sake. seen one too many movies. Now, Sid, don't you blame the movies. Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos more creative. No! Stop it, Billy, would you, all right? The fact that the film references movies like Carrie, Psycho, Silence of the Lambs, and are motivating their murders, alibis, and ideologies behind these films make it obvious to some that not only are these guys psycho themselves, or that they watch one too many movies, but that those movies constructed their plans for the previous murders of the film, thus an intertext. Now, with self-reflexive horror within Scream, we also see the intertextuality at play in parodies. Also known as a paratext, or things in a published work that accompany the text, things such as the author's name, the title, preface, or introduction, or illustrations. This means that things such as parodies are an accompaniment of the text it is referencing. In this case, Keenan Ivory Wayans' 2000 Hello, horror film parody scary movie does just that by imitating scenes from Scream and many others alongside it. Parody, as author and theorist Stephen Keen suggests, is an inner text in itself. It takes images, symbols, constructs, dialogue, and turns it on its head to make a serious piece of text into a joke or camp, a form of intentional camp in this case. Fast forward to the year 2012. Drew Goddard's film, The Cabin in the Woods, is a less campy example of intertextuality. We see throughout the film elements that make up a horror and or disaster film. These things are then explicitly stated in the following scene. There must be at least five. The whore, she's corrupted. She dies first. The athlete. The scholar, the fool, the virgin. Me. Virgin, we work with what we have. What the fuck I look like? Also, Sigourney Weaver is no stranger to the genre. Another element within intertextuality is an ensemble of characters that effectively play the roles of the whore, the athlete, the scholar, the Fool, and The Virgin within disaster and horror cinema. This film is a contemporary example of how intertextuality in self-reflexive horror and disaster films have evolved. Joss Whedon, writer of the film, included this element, the element of the man behind the screen and the monsters that exist within the genre, to explicitly state to the audience why we love the genre so much and what happens if we stray away from the successfully proven formula that has made successful horror and disaster films with a very extreme consequence. So, the next time you watch a movie within the horror or disaster genre, and you make links to that film with others that aren't as obviously stated as they are in Scream, remember intertextuality, the elements, conventions, and or plots in texts that influence the text in question. Think about Scream, Scary Movie, and The Cabin in the Woods, and how they sparked an interest in self-reflexive horror disaster films. Thank you for watching.